you. Sorry, I was just picking something up about recording. I'm going to talk to you about the early history of higher education in the Midlands, focusing particularly on the University of Birmingham, where I worked for 33 years. And some of you, I'm sure, know it quite well. It's distinguished by a very tall clock tower, which can be seen <clears throat> from quite a long distance. Birmingham has usually had an extremely bad press. Um, in 1815, Jane Austen made one of her less attractive characters describe it as a place not to promise very much. And she always thought it was direful in the sound. Well, that's rather what I felt when I first saw it at the age of 12. I thought it was absolutely ghastly not knowing, of course, that I was going to have 33 very happy years working there. So um, what I want to do now is set it in context. Um, although uh, Jane Austen thought it was horrible in 1815, 200 years ago, it was really quite attractive. Um, in the 18th century, it was quite difficult, I think, to build anything that um, <coughs> looked um, nasty. So I'm going to start by <coughs> showing you a map of how it looked in 1781. Um, you can see in the middle of it a little square, which is where St Philip's Cathedral was. And a little, little way below that, oh, you can see New Street. Now, this is what it looked like in part of it, certainly in 1732. This is the north prospect of the square in Birmingham. I don't know which square it was, but it does look quite attractive, doesn't it, and quite neat. This is a view from the south, uh, done in 1783, showing university, the, showing the city very much as cities in 18th century engravings often looked. You get the buildings in the distance, and then in the foreground, you can often see something quite different. On the left, for example, there's a couple of people who are flirting with each other, and you can also see a hay wain and some animals uh, <coughs> trotting about. It also had its share of some fine buildings, some very fine houses, many of which were destroyed in the priestly riots of the 1790s. But uh, this one is Edgbaston Hall, and you can see underneath it says it's the home of Dr. Johnston. Now, Dr. Johnston was one of several eminent doctors in, um, in Birmingham, and this brings me really to the beginning of higher education, which started in Birmingham with the teaching of medicine. Dr. Johnson had a friend um, called <coughs> Dr. Um, Dr. John Ash. Uh, this is a painting of him by Reynolds. And between them, they founded a hospital in 1779. This was the general hospital. And it started life um, as a sort of teaching hospital. And they did award certificates to students. And we do have a copy of one of the first ones. This one is dated 1797, and it was given to a young doctor called Adam Shaw. Dr. Johnston um, did actually think that perhaps one of these days uh, in the future, there will be a college founded. And um, the university and higher education, in fact, in Birmingham was really the creation of three wise men, as I call them. None of them ever met. But collectively, they are responsible. They were all the right men in the right places at the right time. First of them was this young man, William Sands Cox, um, born in 1801. He was the son of a doctor in Birmingham, and he trained in London at Guy's and St Thomas's. And when he came back to work with his father, he thought he could probably do a bit better than the teaching that was available at the General Hospital. So he decided to set up some classes. And in 1825, he put this advertisement in the Birmingham Gazette, um, announcing a course of anatomical demonstrations, uh, starting on Wednesday, the 1st of December, in his father's house in Temple Row. And he mentions somewhere near the bottom that he has the approbation and sanction of Dr. Johnston, whose house I showed you a little bit earlier. The lectures were extremely successful, and he decided, as a result, to found a school of medicine and surgery in 1828. And this was very pleasing to the parents of young uh, doctors in Birmingham because before this, they would have had to go to London to train and their parents were naturally rather worried about 
uh, the influences that they might come <coughs> into contact with in the wicked city. So they were extremely glad to be able to keep them at home and do their training on the spot. The School of Medicine and Surgery was very successful. And um, in 1836, um, Sands Cox persuaded King William IV to give his approbation to it. And um, he called it the Royal School of Medicine and Surgery. Now, one problem was that the General Hospital was providing the clinical work, but it couldn't really uh, uh, <clears throat> provide all the, work, all the experience that he needed. So he took the very unusual step of founding his own teaching hospital. And here is a picture of it. Um, <clears throat> it was in Bath Row. The building is still there. It was once the accident hospital and is now, I think, a hall of residence. At least it was last time I went to have a look at it. In 1841, he decided to call it the Queen's College because Queen Victoria had now come to the throne. And at the same time, he renamed the hospital. Sorry, he called this the Queen's, Queen's Hospital. And at the same time, he renamed his college as uh, Queen's College. Um, this was the operating theatre in the Queen's Hospital. This picture was taken about 1897, so quite a long time after Sands Cox's time. But this is the Queen's College, formerly the School of Medicine and Surgery. It's long gone, it's been demolished, but you can still see its facade in Broad Street in Birmingham. Um, here it is. Uh, and here is a close up of the doorway. For quite a long time, it was a branch of the station of Stanford and Mann. Now, this is a picture of Sands Cox <clears throat> in later life, um, not really quite as handsome as he was a year, as a young man. Uh, there were some problems. He was not very good with people. He was also very controlling. And um, in, <clears throat> in about the 1850s, he attracted a gift from a gentleman called the Reverend Samuel Warnford, who was a Cotswold parson. And there were strings attached to this gift. He said that all the staff of the hospital and the college had to be practicing Anglicans. And in a city which has, has a very large nonconformist population, this soon led to problems. There was a great deal of bickering going on and uh, quite a lot of unhappiness. And the general hospital staff got fed up and decided to found a school of their own in 1851. Now this brings us to the second of the three wise men I mentioned, Sir Josiah Mason, who was born in Kidderminster. This is a picture of the, not exactly his birthplace, but the house which was on the spot of his birthplace in Mill Street. And this is a plaque upon it, which you can't see very easily from this slide. But what it says is, in this house, the house which formerly stood here, Sir Josiah Mason, founder of the Mason Orphanage and Mason Science College, Birmingham, was born on February the 23rd, 1795. Mason was the son of a carpet weaver, very poor family. He left school at the age of eight, but he was very resourceful. He found himself lots of um, little jobs. Uh, he used to, his mother used to bake cakes, which he sold in the streets. And um, he used to help shopkeepers by sorting out their small change and bagging up the pennies. He was a very modest man, also a very kindly one. Um, he had no children, although he was married. This is a bust of him, which um, stands in the university. And um, he eventually left school and went to Birmingham and made a fortune from the making of pen nibs. He had a very nice little box design to put them in. Um, there's a little recess in the lid where the pen nibs sits. And at the bottom, you can see there's a trademark design mason with a mermaid. Now, I think he found this device of a mermaid from looking at a book of family crests. And if you look at Masons, you see quite often they have a mermaid as their crest and sometimes a double headed lion. And he obviously chose the mermaid to go on his trademark box. As a pen maker, he became extremely rich and decided to spend most of his money on philanthropy. Uh, he learnt quite early on that indiscriminate charity was not a very good idea. Uh, he once gave some money to an old woman in the street and a bit later found her lying in the gutter extremely drunk. 
so um, he decided he shouldn't spend his money in that way. But he looked at what he thought were the two most vulnerable groups in the early 19th century, the destitute women and children. So he founded almshouses for women and a very large orphanage at Erdington for, for children. Um, <clears throat> having done all that, he then thought, what else could, could he do? And he saw a need for really more education in Birmingham. It was a very large scientific centre and he thought a college to teach science would be extremely useful. So he had to look around <coughs> um, how he might do this and he had various ideas. He thought he could perhaps um, join Queen's College, but he was put off by all the wrangling that was going on there. Um, he looked at various other institutions which he could join and didn't like those either. So he decided to go it alone. And as it happened, he had a spot of land which belonged to him in Edmund Street in the centre of Birmingham, quite near New Street. And he decided that would be the place to build his science college. So you've got an architect called Mr. Cossins who designed this Victorian Gothic building very much in the French style in Edmund Street. And just on the left, you can see what I think is the old public library. The foundation stone was laid in 1875 and we celebrated that at the university several years ago. The college was opened in 1880 in the town hall. And here you can see Sir Josiah standing on the platform. He was a very shy man, he very rarely spoke. And although he had a speech written, he wasn't able to deliver it. So somebody had to, had to read it for him. It was quite an important civic event and various medals were struck. Uh, this is one showing Sir Josiah on the front and the college on the back. And this is an early photograph of the college in um, Paradise. You can, see, you can see the Chamberlain Fountain in the middle. And uh, the top, very top pinnacle, you can't quite see it, but there is a mermaid. And years later, when the college was demolished, the mermaid was saved and now sits in the University Guild of Students in a special case. I always think she looks a bit like an antique uh, statue from, um, from ancient Rome. And this was the college badge. <clears throat> and here you've got both the devices that you could have if your name was Mason, a mermaid and a double-headed lion um, with um, a nice motto, Dun Spiro, Sparrow. I, <clears throat> it's um, I, while I live, I hope. Well, the college was very successful um, and quite a fine building. Uh, this photograph was taken probably about 1890, but um, some 50 years later, or 60 years later, I actually went there as a student. Some of you may remember uh, the college building before it was pulled down in 1963. Uh, I used to go there to lectures sometimes from school, and I remember it as being incredibly dismal and cold and rather dirty. And I didn't really like it very much at all. This is one of the lecture rooms. I believe this is the medical lecture room, which was destroyed by a bomb in the war. But um, I remember sitting in a lecture room very similar to this. And if you notice the crossbars across the ceiling, I was very intrigued because quite a lot of beer bottles have been put up there, presumably by, by cheeky students. They were very uncomfortable seats, I remember. Uh, this was the college library. Um, there are two busts you can perhaps see in the distance. The left one is of Dr. Heslop, who gave a great many books to the college library. And the one on the right is a Birmingham poet called Constance Naden, um, who read geology at the college and uh, was, was very well known, but died, died rather, sun, rather, rather early. But to start with, they only taught four subjects, maths, physics, chemistry, and biology. The first professor of physics was a chap called J.H. Pointing. And what he's doing here is carrying out a very unusual experiment. He's actually weighing the earth. Um, the uh, technical term was that he was measuring the gravitational constant. And I won't tell you how many pounds it weighed because uh, there was far too many uh, noughts in it. Um, but it was quite a famous experiment, as still remembered. And uh, one of the students did a cartoon of him, um, a student called Dennis Lilly. And uh, here's little Professor pointing with his little balance. Um, and uh, <clears throat> two people standing above him looking a bit, a bit disdainful. 
they soon added several other subjects to, to the college and it was really very successful indeed. And uh, so successful in fact that in 1882, only two years after it had been opened, nearly all the classes at Queen's College were transferred to it. And that of course meant they got far more students. And in 1892, even the whole medical faculty from Queen's College transferred to Mason College. So Queen's now had nothing much to teach except um, theology. In 1934, it was actually recognised as a theological college, and it's now in Somerset Road in, in Edgbaston. By 1887, uh, the college was so well known and doing so well that people were beginning to talk of having a university for the Midlands. And again, like Sir Josiah Mason, they had various ideas. Um, they could have perhaps a federation of local colleges like the Victoria University in, um, in Liverpool, which is what was made up of three colleges. Um, and whilst they were talking about it, uh, the third of the three wise men came on the scene. And this was Joseph Chamberlain, um, Lord Mayor of Birmingham, Colonial Secretary, Member of Parliament, well known for his work on transforming Birmingham. He brought gas and water to, to the city, got rid of a lot of the slums which were near what is now Corporation Street. And um, unlike Mason, he loved speaking. And unlike Sands Cox, he could listen and learn and didn't expect to, to rule the roost completely. Um, in 1881, he became a trustee of the Mason College, but he was fairly inactive for some years. He was rather busy as colonial secretary with the Boer War. Um, but in 1896, he became the rector of Glasgow University. And this showed him what a civic university should be like. And he came back to Birmingham and said, it must be the University of Birmingham or he would be out of it. Um, so that's really the, how the university got founded. Um, he put his mind to raising money, getting hold of staff. He worked at really breakneck speed. He was a brilliant um, negotiator. Um, and in 1898, Mason College became a university college. Chamberlain saw it really as a seamless move, um, using the Mason College building as the university building, uh, using all the staff they got already. And we even find in the archives, in the archives that um, the minute books were seamless, that it carried on as well. Very responsible use of paper, I've always thought. So some minute book start as Mason College and they carry on when it's the university. Now, of course, the university needed a principal um, as vice chancellors were called in those days. And he head hunted Sir Oliver Lodge, who was professor of physics at Liverpool to come and be the principal of the new university. And they also needed a chancellor, of course, and Joe was the obvious choice to be chancellor. And here he is in the chancellor's robes, which I think are still in use or very similar ones. And they also got um, a coat of arms. And this unites the two Mason symbols, uh, the double headed lion and the mermaid. And um, the motto is per ardua ad alta, which means through difficulties to the heights. The charter was granted in 1900, but the previous year a spanner had been thrown in the works one of the benefactors whom Chamberlain attracted was Andrew Carnegie, the great iron and steel magnate from Pittsburgh, who had actually come from Scotland and, like Sir Josiah Mason, gave nearly all his money away, built many public libraries all over the, all over the country. Uh, the first one was actually in Dunfermline, where, where he lived. And um, he wrote to Chamberlain, he offered him £50,000, which was a tremendous amount of money. Uh, in this letter dated 3rd of June, 18, uh, 1899. Um, and um, he asked Joe what he was going to do with it. And of course, Joe said he was going to use the Mason College building and uh, didn't really need any other buildings at all. It was all there. Andrew Carnegie, of course, lived in the United States and he knew what a university campus should look like and said that he really didn't think that Mason College would be suitable um, there wasn't any room for expansion for a start, and um, he said, I fear the Mason College building uh, and much of its apparatus would not be of the slightest use as part of a modern scientific university school. He went on to say, the money must be spent or you will get nothing. 
which really put Chamberlain on the spot. In other words, if he didn't build a nice university campus, he wasn't going to get the money at all. And he added a postscript saying, I should like to pay the expenses of the right man or two to visit Cornell, Stevens, Ann Arbor and Yale. Do send them, I'll give them letters. Well, two of them uh, took advantage of this very kind invitation to a holiday and uh, went over to the States to have a look at uh, universities there. Uh, Joe capitulated completely. Um, the first um, degree day took place in 1901. And uh, here they all are with Joe sitting in the front row and two or three rows behind are his, uh, is his son, Neville Chamberlain. And here's one of the first postcards. This came out in 1904 where it actually says the University of Birmingham at the bottom and uh, shows the college. But of course, now Joe had to think about if um, Carnegie was so keen to have a campus, where on earth could it be? Fortunately, he was a great friend of Lord Calthorpe, who happened to have some spare land on the north of the Bristol Road in Edgbaston. But this is a map which I found lying around on the floor in a dusty room in the university many years ago. So I fished it out and got it mended. And you can perhaps see the Bristol Road is running across the middle and the land to the north is where the university now stands, quite a large, um, quite a large uh, acreage and uh, Lord Calthorpe was very willing to hand it over. So that was all absolutely fine. Um, meanwhile, the um, <coughs> professors who'd been to the USA had seen several campuses and at least two of them had towers. Uh, this is Cornell, the nice tower, and this is Yale with another nice tower. Um, Chamberlain had appointed Sir Aston Webb as the architect of the university and uh, told him that he'd got to have a tower. So Sir Aston Webb started doing, um, doing some designs. Here's one of them. There were lots of different kinds of tower that he put up, but uh, on this design, you can see the, his plan to have a semicircle with rather Byzantine looking domes and a tower in the middle. Here is another one where it's flat. You can see the frontage of the Great Hall here. And another one, I always think this tower looks a bit Chinese. Uh, the Great Hall is uh, standing in front of it. And yet another one. And <clears throat> here is one of the first views of the starting of the building. Uh, on the site, and you can see the Aston Webb semicircle, as we call it, uh, quite quite clearly here. And here's another one, terrible mess, of course. Now, this is the tower that was finally chosen. Uh, it's said that this was Chamberlain's own idea. He marched into a meeting one day when they were talking about various designs of towers, and he said, no, I want a Siena tower. Uh, he and his wife had been to Siena on their travels in Italy and had admired it very much. And um, this is a photograph which I took myself some years ago. So that was what they had to do. Uh, this design had already been used about half a century before. This is a water tower at Grimsby, uh, which looks very much like, uh, like the university tower. So Sir Aston Webb had to go back to the drawing board. And here's one of his designs with the tower very much as it, as it is now. And um, they started building pretty quickly. This is, I think, about 1907. And you can see the tower rising um, quite, quite, quite quickly. It's quite tall. In 1909, uh, the buildings were more or less ready for an official opening. And they invited King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra to come and perform the opening. And it was a tremendous civic event. I think it was the first royal visit to Birmingham since uh, about the 1850s. So you can see the queen standing in the middle there and uh, the king to her side. And little girl on the left, if you can see, is um, Joseph Chamberlain's granddaughter. Chamberlain sadly couldn't be there uh, because he recently had a stroke, but uh, it was a very important day and a tremendous fuss was made in the press and everything. Uh, the buildings were more or less ready, but uh, I'm told, and I think it's true, that the clock tower, although it was finished, um, hadn't got the clock mechanism installed yet. So in order to stop the king thinking that time was standing still all the time he was in Birmingham, they got a young man to climb up the clock tower and just move the hands very slowly. 
so that it looked as if it was working. They made a statue of King Edward VII, which used to stand in the great hall, at the, in, the, in the great entrance hall of the, the main building, but I'm afraid it's now in a cubicle some way down the corridor, so not, uh, not quite such, uh, such a posh place. Several souvenirs were um, pr uh, produced as a result of the opening. This is a ribbon plate, which we had in the archives, uh, showing the buildings with the clock tower. And a selection of postcards were also um, provided. Um, the top one shows the King and the Queen and Alderman Kenrick. And the bottom one shows um, Alderman Beale, Joseph Chamberlain in the middle, and Sir Oliver Lodge, the Vice Chancellor and Principal at the side. I'll show you now a few pictures of the inside. <clears throat> this is what I always call the corridor of power. You can see it's, it's part of the semicircle curving round. And um, there's another floor below and another one above and a basement right underneath where they keep what they call the heating tunnels. And I had to walk through them on one occasion. I'm not quite sure why. I think it was because the people running the power station had invited me to go and have a look round and thought the tour would not be complete if I didn't walk around the heating tunnels. So we ranged all over the campus underground in these tunnels. But we knew when we were under the Aston Webb building because it curved a bit like um, in the Wind of the Willows. I think um, Toad, Mr. Toad and, and Badger and co uh, are going under the tunnels to Toad Hall and they know exactly when they're underneath it. And I certainly knew when I was underneath the Aston Webb building. And here's the Great Hall as it is now. And um, above the entrance door, there's a plaque saying that from August 1914 to April 1919, these buildings were used by the military authorities as the first Southern General Hospital. Within these walls, men died for their country. Um, there were a lot of hospitals obviously set up in England during the First World War. The first Southern General uh, was here at Birmingham. And um, a lot of the troops um, who were nursed there, those that survived, were sent to various buildings in Worcestershire, which had been set up as hospitals, one of which was Hartlebury Castle. So a lot of the troops from this hospital were sent to Hartlebury and they were nursed there. And in the library at Hartlebury, uh, we have minute books and visitors books in which they've written things about how beautifully they've been nursed and how they hoped if they were sent back to the front, they'd get another blighty and they could come back to Hartlebury. They weren't always in great comfort. This is a photograph of some of them being nursed in tents just outside the Aston Webb building. The nurses were accommodated in the first hall of residence, known as University House, uh, which of course is still there. And here are some more patients being looked after. I think it's rather blurred, but I think they're, they're, they're in, in wheelchairs. The officers were put somewhere much better. This is the Great Hall when it was actually a hospital ward for officers. And um, <clears throat> the, um, they used to play the organ at night to lull them to sleep. After the war, the university had settled down, and um, this is a view of it taken in the 1930s. You can see it's still quite a small area. Um, you can see the semicircle, you can see the clock tower in the middle. On the left, there's a very fine poplar avenue going right up to what was then the North Gate. And down on the bottom left, you could perhaps see a building which was actually the university power station. The university was extremely pragmatic. It needed lots of teaching aids and it would sometimes let one building do the job of several others. And the power station had a great many machines and no two of them were alike. The idea was that they would provide the teaching necessary for um, engineering students. Um, by the 1950s, this had become quite unworkable. So they had to put it down and build a new one. But um, it shows, I think, um, how sensible they were using everything they could at least twice. They also had a model coal mine because the university taught, it, taught mining, the first one to do so. So they had a little model coal mine uh, somewhat off the picture to the right, uh, which is actually still there, although it's locked up. I think, um, I think they keep um, things they don't want or radio nasties and things like that in it. Um, but it had about a mile of mine, of, of, of corridors, I think, which uh, the mining students could, uh, could, could walk along. Um, 
This is a view looking down from the north gate uh, towards the clock tower. Um, and this is a view that will never be seen again and is very much regretted by former members of the university because it shows the Poplar Avenue going down to the clock tower. Unfortunately, in 1952, this had to be dug up um, because it was time to have a library actually on the campus. The, um, <clears throat> there was a problem with have, um, the Mason College building was still being used. So the university was really on two sites. And it was said at one point that um, you couldn't read a book on astronomy or the word, poems of Wordsworth in the same place. One of them was in Edmund Street and the other one was at Edgbaston. So it wasn't really very efficient. Um, I think they kept the, the um, old college site for much longer than they'd intended, probably because of the two world wars uh, taking <coughs> coming on. But um, they did have to build a library in the 1950s and they sadly had to dig up the Poplar Avenue in order to build it. And, and here it is, although I worked there for many years and I was very happy in it, but it did, it did destroy the Poplar Avenue. So by 1959, everything was on the main campus and the college building was emptied. All the furniture was taken away. Some chairs were saved and brought to the university. But the problem with the Mason College building was that it had never been properly maintained. Here's a view of it, again, probably about the time I first saw it. Uh, you can perhaps see a seated statue in the middle. Um, and that's this, Sir Josiah Mason which I've never actually seen because when the college was demolished, it disappeared and goodness knows where it went. But um, because they always thought that um, the college building would um, not be used for, forever, they didn't bother to carry out any maintenance on it. And it became a pretty awful building. It certainly was when I saw it in 1959. Um, I remember an absolutely ghastly canteen. I got a terrible stomach upset after the lunch that they served there. Um, and members of staff who remember working there said it was really ghastly. There were rats in the basement and um, the library had holes in the floor, which were patched with metal plates and the roof dripped and altogether it was in pretty awful state. So they decided that the only thing to do was to demolish it. And this is what they did in 1963. Much to very many people's regret. And um, this is what Bill was built afterwards, the Central Library. And um, I think even that's gone now too, to the New Library of Birmingham. This is a view of the campus in about 1975. Um, you can see the clock tower in the middle, uh, the Aston Webb building in the foreground with the Great Hall building looking rather like a chapel. And just beyond the clock tower, you can see the main library. Um, and a building called the Muirhead Tower to the, to the right of it, and a running track. Quite a cluttered campus, going too fast. And here's the Aston Webb building, very much as it looks now, very red brick, and um, a listed building now. I remember when I first saw it, I didn't like red brick at all and thought it was absolutely horrible, but um, it really does grow on you. And the clock tower, as, it's, as it looks now, in what seems to be quite a rural little enclave. Um, it's just part of the campus. But um, when it was first um, being built, uh, the students were quite scathing. They said it looked like um, like a factory chimney. And one of them said it won't be used for anything. It's of no use at all. It was, however, used uh, for fire watching uh, during the Second World War. And in 1978, the link to the city was restored in this very novel way. This is the University Station open then. Um, I think Joseph Chamberlain would probably quite approved of um, uh, such, a, such, a, such a link to the city of his dreams. Um, for many years, I thought it was the only station in the world called simply University. But uh, when I did a trip around Hong Kong, I found that there was in the new territories, there was a station there called University as well. Uh, so it wasn't actually the, the only one. And then sometime after I retired, the last great change took place. Um, this is a view of the main library seen across the campus. Um, and um, this was actually demolished a few years ago. 
the vice chancellor decided they really need to open up the campus again and uh, he called it the green heart and this is the final view just on the left is the new main library which um, has a lot of gold on it uh, rather like the hive in Worcester which I'm sure you're all quite familiar with uh, that there's actually not a lot of red brick in sight now so you can see quite far in the distance but uh, it's very very different from the campus that um, that uh, Chamberlain was envisaging so thank you very much